More Israeli bombs hit populated towns in Gaza as the US Secretary of State arrives in the region. A man dies in an ultralight plane crash in the wheat belt. Fighting in Ukraine takes its toll. Ukrainian generals call for an extra half a million troops to be mobilised. And a fitting end, David Warner scores a half century in his farewell to Test cricket. Hello and welcome to ABC News, I'm Brianna Shepherd. Senior US diplomats are scrambling to stop the Israel-Gaza war from spilling over into a wider regional conflict after the killing of a senior Hamas official in Lebanon this week. The leader of the Iranian-backed Hezbollah militia, which Australia lists as a terrorist organisation, is warning his heavily armed group will retaliate. And a warning, this story contains confronting footage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nearly three months into this war, and the growing casualty list is a daily procedure. 58,000 Palestinians wounded, 22,600 dead. But there is nothing routine about the grief Abdel has for his two sons, killed in an Israeli airstrike on Rafah. The Israeli government claims democracy and humanity, but they are inhumane. <laughs> for the others who have lost loved ones, today is their chance to say goodbye. Propaganda videos released by both sides show a land of rubble with little food and water. The UN says Gaza is now uninhabitable. In Israel, relatives cling to a hope they can get their loved ones back. Hostages taken by Hamas in their brutal surprise attack on October 7th, when nearly 1,200 innocent people were killed. Michael's two-year-old nephew has been without his parents since the attack. The boy's mother killed by Hamas. My little brother O had to witness his wife being murdered in front of him before he was kidnapped into Gaza. Why are we still here? Yarden's sister Romy is one of those being held hostage. Every time I'm trying to eat something, I feel ashamed because I don't know what or when she ate last. Lives cast adrift by loss. They didn't do anything wrong. And now facing a conflict which threatens to snowball into a regional war. <laughs> after a suspected Israeli drone strike killed a senior Hamas official in Lebanon this week and continued cross-border skirmishes. <laughs> Hezbollah's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, warning the strikes will lead to retaliation from the group. When they are targeting places in Lebanon, in our southern suburbs, we cannot accept this violation. We cannot remain silent. Hezbollah, which like Hamas rejects Israel's right to exist, is armed with up to 150,000 missiles and is backed by Iran. That's 150,000 reasons to worry the United States, with US Secretary of State Antony Blinken touching down in Turkey as part of a multi-day diplomatic visit to push for peace. Hopes for an end to this war seem far away here in Gaza. Reem went to sleep in her home. Suddenly we found ourselves amongst the rubble. People were screaming and crying. Families enduring one more night, wondering when the airstrikes will stop. Henry Zwartz, ABC News. A 69-year-old man has died after crashing his ultralight plane in WA's Wheatbelt region. Police say the man took off from his own property before crashing on neighbouring land near the town of Beverley about 11 o'clock this morning. He was the only person on board. Police say the cause of the crash is not yet known. Yeah, that's going to be part of the investigation that we'll try and find out and put it together and just see exactly what he was doing at the time, if he was taking off landing. Um, you know, we can't really say what caused the crash, that's what we're going to determine. The US Supreme Court will decide next month whether former President Donald Trump can be kept off the presidential ballot for the US election in November. It comes after the state of Colorado and Maine barred Mr Trump from appearing on the Republican president primary ballot due to his role in the January 6 Capitol riots. As the current president launches his bid for re-election this year, Joe Biden's taken aim at his opponent. I'll say what Donald Trump won't. Political violence is never, ever acceptable in the United States political system. Never, never, never. It has no place in a democracy. 
Convicted murderer Oscar Pretorius has spent his first day at home after serving half of his prison sentence for shooting his girlfriend Reva Steenkamp in 2013. Friends and family of Ms Steenkamp say watching her killer walk free has been confronting and difficult, with some advocates claiming South Africa's justice system is too lenient. Free from prison and flowers on his doorstep, Oscar Pistorius will serve parole here at his uncle's luxury mansion in Pretoria. The 37-year-old was released on Friday after serving about eight of his 13-and-a-half-year murder sentence. In South Africa, all offenders can be considered for parole once they've served half their term. We have a serious problem that there's, uh, I guess, a, a normalisation of leniency when it comes to predators, when it comes to anyone who commits any type of femicide or gender-based violence. Pistorius shot his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp, behind a locked bathroom door in his home in 2013. He claimed he thought it was an intruder. I got to the bed and then I realised Reva wasn't there. He was first convicted of a charge equivalent to manslaughter in 2014, but on appeal he was charged with murder. The judges said his story was flawed and implausible. The trials captured the world's attention. Pistorius was once considered a sporting hero in South Africa. Famous for being a sprinter, known as the Blade Runner, the first double amputee to compete at the Olympics. His 29-year-old girlfriend, a model and law graduate, her friends and family say this is a difficult moment. We want to mourn and we most certainly would like Riva to rest in peace. Every time we start processing and coming to terms with things, Oscar pops up. In a statement, her mother wrote, Has there been justice for Reva? Has Oscar served enough time? There can never be justice if your loved one is never coming back. We are the ones living a life sentence. I think it's high time in this country that we stop making predators feel like this is the safe haven. South Africa is the place to be as a predator because it's definitely not the place to be as a victim or a survivor. Pistorius will live under strict parole conditions until his full release in 2029. Isabella Higgins, ABC News. The last of the 130,000 South East Queensland homes that lost power on Christmas Day should be reconnected by tomorrow. It's been one of the biggest jobs the state-owned electricity company has carried out. It's been almost two weeks and Oxenford State School still resembles a battleground. Branch by branch, the clean-up continues with the military support. Locals are exhausted. A lot of people are stressed, a lot of people are exhausted, um, a lot of people are really emotional right now. In the hinterland, 50 kilometres of power lines were brought down. And they're hoping, as we said, um, that they will have it all connected by this weekend. These crews have been working around the clock since Christmas. They're finally on the home stretch. And we'd like to say thank you to the community for being patient. We know it's challenging. It's been a roller coaster for businesses too. At Dreamworld, 100 trees were toppled, forcing the theme park to close during the peak holiday period, but the rides have now reopened. We've still enjoyed it, but it would have been better to be under all, all the rain. The locals here just got absolutely uh, yeah. hammered with the weather. Tambourine Mountain is the little town that could. They've endured more than 12 days without power or running water. Today, the footy club put on a barbecue at the showgrounds, everyone leaving with a smile, a full belly and as many groceries as they could carry, all free of charge. Yeah, it's just a fun day to get everybody out, getting supplies and getting a bit of normality, I guess, back in their lives. After all this community has been through, spirits here are still high. For many, today was a well-earned break, a chance to catch their breath after weeks of cleaning up, but there's still a long road ahead. Can only get better from here. Mackenzie Collahan, ABC News, Tambourine Mountain. When hackers were found to have broken into Victoria's court system before Christmas, it presented an increasingly common dilemma to pay a ransom to recover sensitive files or risk having them published for the world to see. Targeted entities don't typically reveal which way they go, but experts say it's extremely unlikely the Victorian government would pay a ransom to criminals. But some companies do. Reporter Ben Knight takes a look at how those decisions are made. In late December, staff in the audio-visual department of Victoria's court system found themselves locked out of their computers and with a ransom note on the screen. 
Now, this is the first publicly known cyber attack on an Australian court system. But really, it was only a matter of time. In the last financial year, the Australian Signals Directorate responded to 127 extortion-related incidents. So why do we only hear about a few of them? Some organisations are clearly not communicating with the public and their stakeholders the way they should. Alistair McGibbon is a former head of the Australian Cyber Security Centre. He now works in the private sector. We see companies and organisations that don't pay uh, where they're never contacted by the criminal and the criminal doesn't do anything. And, of course, we've seen some terrible examples uh, where, where uh, payments aren't made and criminals do carry out their threat. Those are the ones that go public, like Optus, which refused to pay a ransom and saw 10,000 of its customers' data published online. Now, experts, both public and private, advise against paying ransoms. But it's not that simple. Every organisation has to consider the risks, whether it's the safety of individuals or whether the cost of fixing the breach is more expensive than paying the ransom. When it comes to the attack on Victoria's courts, it's even trickier. Alan Lisker is a US-based threat analyst. He's seen attacks on court systems around the world. Governments are among the least likely uh, agencies to pay, which is unfortunately why we see so much court data leaked by these ransomware actors, because they don't get paid for it. Alistair McGibbon says more Australian organisations need to speak up about ransom attacks. I think we will see more and more of this reporting over the years as organisations get more comfortable with uh, owning up to the fact that they've been victims of crime. There is no shame in being a victim of crime. The shame is on the criminals, but we can all do more to prevent criminality and that's what we've got to do uh, in 2024. Now, most often, of course, the victims are the general public because it's their private information that's at stake. Getting compensation can be difficult, and in this case, it might not even be possible. Ben Knight, ABC News, Melbourne. As the conflict in Ukraine drags into a third year, the enormous cost of the war is mounting. President Zelensky continues to plead with the US and Europe for more funds and weapons, but his country is running low on fighters. The average age of a Ukrainian soldier is now over 40. Top generals are calling for an extra half a million troops to be mobilised from the civilian population. Currently, only men 27 and older can be conscripted, but a new bill is proposing it be reduced to 25. It's having a disproportionate impact on smaller rural towns. Europe correspondent Steve Kinane reports from the Sumi region in the country's northeast. The women of Krasnopilla have been doing their fair share of praying in recent times. Many of the men from this village are fighting on the front lines, and not all of them make it back alive. We have increased the number of burials of young men, around 25 to 35 years old. We bury them almost every week, even twice a week. Krasnopila is around 15 kilometres from the Russian border, and the war has had a devastating impact on this community. Around 50 of this area's best and brightest have died fighting for Ukraine since February last year. That's out of a population of around 20,000. At the local newspaper, the editor makes sure to pay tribute to each fallen soldier from this town. These are our guys, our defenders. How can I not write about them? They gave their lives for Ukraine, for the Kasnaprila region. It is my duty to tell the stories of these boys and girls. With so many men at the front lines, local industries are struggling. Sergei's bakery has found it hard to get delivery drivers and tradesmen. Currently, we've engaged our pensioners who can no longer go to war. There are no guys who can plough and harvest and a lot of agricultural land has remained uncultivated. Ukraine doesn't provide figures of its dead or wounded. But we do know that casualties did increase following the counter-offensive in June. And increasingly, Ukraine is relying on small towns like this one to mobilise even more troops. This village is small. We all know each other. Someone serves in every family. Shopkeeper Tetiana has a husband and a son serving in the army. 
She hopes they will return home soon. I really hope for it. Really, every wife waits for it, dreams of it. Every mother, every wife, every child dreams of seeing their father and mother at home. We all hope very much with all our hearts and with all our souls. In the meantime, the local women keep praying that 2024 will bring better news for their soldiers fighting on the front lines. Steve Kinane, ABC News, Krasnopila. A skilled and compassionate doctor, a humanitarian, a man who should be remembered for his incredible life. Leading paediatrician Dr Michael Jung has been farewelled in a touching service in Adelaide. Dr Jung died after being injured in a break-in at his home last month. A man has been charged with his murder. A farewell to a man who made a difference. Michael was always campaigning for change, thinking about how we could improve the care we delivered. Despite the tragic circumstance of his death, Dr Michael Jung's funeral was a celebration of his life. We gather here to honour Michael's life, not to recall the manner of his death. Evil must not win. He was remembered as a man who led the paediatric intensive care unit at the Women's and Children's Hospital and set up a similar unit in Kenya. He had also established an Indigenous medical scholarship in honour of his wife, Catherine Brown Jung, who died suddenly in 2020. He recognised that Indigenous Australians were disadvantaged in many ways, including health, and did something concrete to change the world. I've been reflecting on their deep love and I've realised how blessed I've been as a son to have had parents that are so profoundly in love. Dr Jung wasn't just remembered for his contributions in the medical field, he was remembered as someone who was funny, had terrible fashion sense, who loved the Beatles and the Hawthorne Football Club. He was the only man I knew that could rock a bum bag. <laughs> the bum bag never left his side. He could recite word for word some passages of commentary from the 2008, 2013, 2014 and 2015 grand finals. A 22-year-old man has been charged with murder over Dr Jung's death and will appear in court in March. Leah McLennan, ABC News. Melbourne Park is buzzing with the arrival of the world's top players as they get ready for round one of the Australian Open. And with a Sunday start, shorter days on court and a $10 million increase in prize money, this year's event looks set to draw record crowds. The silverware has been polished and the countdown is on. It is just going to go bull yeah, like it's going to be fantastic. Some big changes are coming for the 15-day tournament, which gets underway next weekend. And to really have a massive opening on a Sunday night, it'd be something special. Security will be tight as usual. Russian and Belarusian colours are still banned as players from both nations continue to compete as neutrals. As for displays of Palestinian and Israeli flags in the stands... If players competing uh, in the event, those flags are allowed to be displayed. Fans can expect more shade at the venue and fewer late nights thanks to scheduling adjustments that include an extra day of play. You cannot guarantee how long a match is going to be, but the likelihood is extremely low. The move is welcomed by three-time Grand Slam winner Andy Murray, who blasted officials last year after a 4am finish against Tanasi Kokonakis. Tennis Australia says ticket sales are already up and it's confident the changes it's made to the tournament will help break last year's record 840,000 people through the turnstiles for this year's main draw. Ten years on from his men's singles win, world number 49 Stan Vavrinka has his sights set high. Yeah, I think I'm playing well. I had some, some bigger, big match, big win. So hopefully I can keep uh, uh, getting better in the ranking, winning some good battle and why not take a trophy home. He and world number four Yannick Sinner had a hit this afternoon. The Italian eager to improve on his fourth round exit last year. Aaron Marcicovetere. ABC News, Melbourne. 
One of Australia's biggest car festivals has taken a brief break from the engine revving to celebrate an iconic hairstyle. The Mullet Fest competition got underway at Summer Nats in Canberra with entrants eager to compare their cuts. They call it business at the front, party at the back. And the starter's gun has been fired in a nationwide search for Australia's best mullets. Hundreds of entrants graced the stage in this round alone. I think I went all right, but there's some, there's some pretty dirty mullets up there. It'll be tough competition. For Curtis, his 80s-inspired hairstyle was never really in doubt. The family tradition, really. Dad's had a mullet, mum's had a mullet, everyone's had a mullet, so you've got to have one. A family affair, too, for the little ones, starting young but no less dedicated than the grown-ups. The only reason I really grew my mullet was for mullet fest. Give us a little turn around. That is very impressive. We actually started growing them together and then, then just with my workspace it just becomes far too hot so I said Hamish you're on your own. But while some of these do's are clearly high maintenance, <laughs> others make it look easy. Just brush it every day and yeah, good yeah. shampoo and conditioner. <laughs> Summer Nats 2024 motored into its final days, but not before the festivities spilled out into suburban Canberra. ACT police seized three cars overnight after Hoon driving incidents. One driver caught doing burnouts has been ordered to front court, with police warning antisocial behaviour will not be tolerated. Patrick Bell, ABC News, Canberra. Time for sport with Tom Wildey and Tom, we've bid farewell to David Warner. The opener bowed out of test cricket in style. Bree scoring a 50 as Australia beat Pakistan by nine wickets to win the series 3-0. Warner was lauded by his home crowd at the Sydney Cricket Ground and leaves the game as Australia's most successful opening batsman. Day four was always going to be about the man playing his last day of test cricket. David Warner leads them on. Pakistan's job, after a disastrous collapse, was to spoil David Warner's party. Takes him on over Gully at the first boundary of the morning. Amir Jamal put on 42 with Mohammad Rizwan before the wicketkeeper fell to Lyon. Yeah! The next two wickets fell quickly as Pakistan was all out for 116, leaving Australia just 130 to win. All eyes were on David Warner as he came out to bat with his childhood friend, Usman Khawaja. Brilliant scenes of love and respect at the SCG. Pakistan, desperate to stay in the game, got Khawaja in the first over. Ah! Oh, that's close. That's really close. He's got him. But Warner soon found his groove. Crunched through the covers. Marnus Labashain joined the party. Nice drive. And David Warner gave the crowd what they came for. 50 for Warner. The Sydney Cricket Ground is his stage. We are blessed to be in the audience. But Warner's luck ran out on 57. Ah! With Pakistan's review of an LBW not out decision. And wickets hitting. And that's it. That is the finish for David Warner. It was left to Labashain to hit the winning runs. Victory for Australia. I've had a lot of ups and downs from my career. Um, I've had to come back and overcome adversity. But I think today just showed to me that, you know, I do have a lot of support. And I'm very, very grateful for that and very thankful for that. It's a big hole that, um, that he's, he's filled and we've got to, yeah, we're going to miss him. And so one era has ended and another is about to begin with the Australian selectors due to pick Warner's replacement for the first test against the West Indies in just 11 days' time. Steve Smith has put his hand up to open the batting, which would allow Cam Green to come back into the side. But there are other specialist openers who also have a claim on the position. David Mark, ABC News, Sydney. The Australian women's cricket team has lost the first of a three-match T20 series against India. India won the toss and sent the tourists into bat. Titus Shadu tore through Australia's top order to finish with figures of four for 17. The Aussies were all out for 141 in the final over as Phoebe Litchfield fell one run short of her half century. India's Shafali Verma led the run chase with an unbeaten 64 as her side reached the target with 14 balls to spare. 
Australia's United Cup hopes lie with Alex Demonor after Angelique Kerber beat Isla Tomlanovic in the first singles rubble of the semi-final. Tom Lanovic won the opening set in impressive fashion before the German bounced back to take the second 6-2. Tom Lanovic fought hard in the third and looks set to snatch the match in the tie-break, but Kerber proved too good as Germany took a 1-0 lead. Dimonor is currently on court against Alexander Zverev, trailing the world number seven, one set to nil. Rafael Nadal's return to the Australian Open is under a cloud after the 37-year-old suffered a flare-up to the same hip which ended his run at Melbourne Park last year. Just three matches into his comeback, he was eliminated by Aussie Jordan Thompson in a marathon quarter-final in Brisbane. A sight no one wanted to see, Rafael Nadal's left hip causing the 37-year-old grief once again. When it happened last year, I felt something uh, drastic uh, immediately. No, not today I didn't feel anything. The only problem is because the, the place is the same, you are a little bit more scared. In his third game in just four days after a year sidelined, this was Rafa's toughest challenge. Put the kettle on, we're going the distance. Jordan Thompson saved three match points, the quarterfinal entering a fourth hour. Thompson has done it. To beat Rafa uh, in Brizzy at home in a quarterfinal, I think it's my first semi-final on a hard court as well, so, um, yeah, couldn't be happier. For Rafa, it'll be a nervous way to see how his body recovers in time for next Sunday's start to the Australian Open. Honestly, I, I am not 100% sure of anything now. Fans could get a potential Oz Open women's final rematch in Brisbane after Elena Rubikinia breezed through her semi final in straight yeah, sets. It's been another devastating display from the number two seed. Top seed Arinia Sabalenka plays Victoria Azarenka for the other place in the final. The men's top seed Holger Rune didn't drop a point in the deciding tiebreaker as he prevailed against Roman Sakulin. The world number eight has booked the spot in the Brisbane International Final. In the United Cup, Poland is the first team through to the decider after Hubert Horkacz and Igor Svontek both won their singles matches. I knew that even if I'm going to you know, make some mistakes, we still have mixed doubles and it was a... Um, I, yeah, it was feeling pretty safe. <laughs> Jessica Stewart, ABC News. Perth Wildcats big man Alex Saar is facing up to three weeks on the sidelines after suffering a hip injury. The highly fancied NBA prospect injured himself during the Wildcats' win over Adelaide on December 28, but played out the game. Scans revealed a strain for the 18-year-old to be reassessed before the Wildcats' match against South East Melbourne on January the 13th. Saar is expected to go high in the NBA draft, with some experts labelling him the potential number one pick. And Bree, that is the latest in sport. Thank you, Tom. Well, it was a bit hotter in the city than expected, with temperatures set to heat up over the next couple of days. Right now in town, it's 26 degrees and humidity is 47%. Perth's minimum was 17.7 degrees, around 10 to 6 this morning, rising to a top of 33.4, around 20 past 2 this afternoon. The state's coolest spot was Windy Harbour, with a minimum of 9 degrees. The state's highest maximum of 45 reached at Marble Bar. Cloud over the northern Kimberley with onshore winds is generating a few thunderstorms, while cloud over the south with southerly winds isn't rain bearing. Clearer elsewhere with hot dry winds. A broad trough will persist over inland Kimberley and the Pilbara into next week. A high pressure ridge lies to the south of the state with a trough set to continue deepening down the west coast over the weekend before moving inland on Monday and lying over central parts of the state by Tuesday. Taking a quick look around the country tomorrow, showers and a possible storm for Adelaide, rain increasing for Melbourne and Hobart, some late rain for Canberra, partly cloudy in Sydney and Brisbane with a shower or two and possible storm set for Darwin. Back to WA and in the north, very hot over the southern Kimberley and Pilbara. Showers and thunderstorms over the Kimberley, northern interior and far eastern Pilbara. Very hot over the Gascoigne, inland central west and northern parts of the lower west. Showers or drizzle over the Eucla and south coast and adjacent inland parts east of Walpole, clearing inland by the afternoon. In Perth, mostly sunny, a top of 35 after an overnight low of 20. Sunrise will be at 18 minutes past five, setting at 26 minutes past seven. 
And looking ahead, a sunny top of 35 to start the week, cooling off a little for Tuesday and Wednesday, tops of 33, with it then set to warm up, a top of 36 for Friday. And that's ABC News. It's been a pleasure having your company. Bye for now.